This is the HAN Network, the leader in local news, sports, arts, and entertainment in southwestern Connecticut. This is your coffee break on the HAN Network. It's Friday, September 25th, and this is your Coffee Break on the HAN Network. I'm Kate Chaplinski, bringing you today's headlines, including the disturbing details of the kidnapping of a 17-year-old girl who was rescued by police recently, and an update on the court appearance of the son of a missing Easton couple. We'll also take a look at the top stories across all of our HAN Network community news websites this week, and AJ Simonowski will be joining us with a sports update, and of course, we'll have Donald Ang's look back on this day. Day in history. But first, on to today's news. 27 year old Kyle Navin, son of the missing couple Jeffrey and Jeanette Navin, was arraigned in federal court in Bridgeport yesterday before Judge William Garfinkel. He pleaded not guilty to the charge of possession of a firearm by an individual who is an unlawful user or addicted to a controlled substance. The date of October 15th was set for defense motions and jury selection was set for November 9th. The arraignment was very brief and lasted about five minutes. Navin walked into the courtroom wearing a tan prison uniform and sporting a full beard. According to the Easton Courier, he walked slowly with a bad limp. Navin stumbled while getting up to plead not guilty to the charge. In August, when he was questioned by police, Navin said he has a broken back. Navin, who has been held in police custody and detention since his arrest on September 8th, he will remain in detention until a hearing for his release is scheduled. Navin's attorney, Eugene Riccio, asked the court on September 11th for a continuance of the detention hearing so he could obtain additional information. On September 17th, a federal grand jury in Bridgeport indicted Kyle Navin with one count of possession of a firearm. The charge carries a maximum term of imprisonment of 10 years. Navin was originally arrested by criminal complaint on September 8th for the same charge. The charge came after an extensive search by state police of Navin's Bridgeport home on Aldine Avenue, which uncovered numerous firearms and ammunition as well as drugs. Kyle's parents, Jeffrey and Jeanette Navin, were reported missing by family members on August 7th. Kyle was reportedly the last person to see them on August 4th. He is a 2006 graduate of Weston High School, where he was a star hockey athlete. You can find a lot more on that story at EastonCourier.com. In other news, the owner of a Waterbury modeling agency was arrested Thursday and charged with kidnapping a teenage girl and forcing her to have sex with more than 50 men, according to the Connecticut Post. Brandon Boots Williams, 34 years old, the owner of Beauty Boots Modeling Agency, was charged with human trafficking, first-degree reckless endangerment, promoting prostitution, and second-degree assault. He was being held in lieu of a $250,000 bond. Police said the 17-year-old girl who was rescued from a local hotel told them that Williams abducted her last month while she was walking home, pistol-whipped her, and forced her into his car. Williams, who lives in Waterbury, reportedly forcibly injected the girl with heroin, tattooed a dollar sign and a 14K on her face, and took her to strip clubs in Bridgeport and New York, where he forced her to perform. When he got tired of having sex with her, police said the girl told them Williams brought her to a motel where over the course of the next couple of weeks, he forced her to have sex with numerous men who paid Williams $60 a piece. Police said the girl said Williams had kept her drugged during the time and that while speaking to detectives, she began sobbing uncontrollably. At one point, police said they noticed the girl was clutching a cell phone and officers attempted to take it from her. The girl was then taken to Yale New Haven Hospital and placed in the custody of the State Department of Children and Families. In other news, Derby Mayor Anita Degato testified Thursday that in 2009 she paid a blogger to stop posting negative comments about herself and her local dental practice. The Valley Independent Sentinel reports that Degato said in U.S. District Court in Hartford that she resigned from her chairmanship of the Democratic Town Committee so the blogger would stop attacking her and her business. The blogger Mel Thompson told her both demands had to be met so the negative posts would stop. Degato testified in the $80 million civil lawsuit that has been brought by Thompson. 
Dugato said Thompson's blog posts, posted anonymously at the time, were so vicious she feared they would affect her dental business in Derby. She was coming off of a divorce, she said, and was responsible for her dental practice with 10 employees. She said in court, quote, my business was being attacked. The credibility of my business was affected, she said. Dugato, elected mayor in 2013, said the negative attacks on Thompson's blog stopped after the conversation. There's a lot more on that story at valleyindy.org. Well, the Fairfield Republican legislative delegation joined Senate and House Republican leaders Thursday to share their concerns about Connecticut's business environment and GE's potential move from Fairfield. State Senator Tony Wong, Representative Brenda Kupchik, and Representative Laura Devlin organized a press conference on the Fairfield Town Hall Green to renew their call for a special session to make holistic changes to the state budget and fight for local businesses, they said. Kupchik said GE is vital to the Fairfield community and the entire state in many ways. She said in addition to thousands of jobs, they spend over $14 billion with other businesses in Connecticut to support the operations. She said those relationships impact over 65,000 supplier jobs across the state. Devlin added that the impact of GE's charitable activity in the state and specifically Fairfield County is incredible. She said if they leave, I fear it will be hard to pull the to plug the hole left behind in many community programs and organizations like the United Way of Coastal Fairfield County. Their employees also provide thousands of hours of volunteer services, she said. Lawmakers emphasize the need for changes in the state budget to benefit all businesses as GE is one of many companies considering leaving the state. According to Senate Minority Leader Len Fasano, the volatility created by Connecticut's newly passed budget is more apparent now than ever. Republicans were joined by Connecticut hospitals earlier this week in calling for a special session to revisit the budget after the governor announced a series of painful cuts that will hit hospitals hard, threatening the financial survival of many institutions. All Republicans voted against the state budget passed earlier this year. Well, it's about time to throw it over to AJ Simonowski, who, in addition to helping with sports today, is also giving us a look at this Friday's weather. AJ. Thanks, Kate. It is a beautiful day outside. 67 degrees here in Shelton. Mostly cloudy tonight. Going to get down to a low of about 52. A little bit of a breeze, but nothing to really be concerned about. Tomorrow, much the same. High in, high in the upper 60s, low in the low 50s. Uh, clear for the rest of the weekend. Chance of some, shower, some showers uh, Sunday night into Monday, and then warming back up next week, back into the uh, the high 70s going to mess with everybody's sinuses. Kate, back to you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, AJ. Well, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, Donald Dang going to give us a look back in history. We're also going to talk local sports and we have a lot more news coming up after this. When you experience a sports injury, you want to get better and fast. Coastal Ortho Express gives you direct access to orthopedic care quickly. Their physicians are fellowship trained in sports medicine at world-class universities and are also team doctors for area football teams. For specialized personal care of sports injuries, go to Coastal Ortho Express. Open Monday through Saturday in the iPark building, 761 Main Avenue in Norwalk or CoastalOrthoExpress.com. Coastal Orthopedics, keeping you on the move. Alliance. We are an industry leader in coordinating transportation for large events such as corporate road shows, conferences, and special events. Our team of experts understands the dynamics and logistics of high pressure situations and complex arrangements, all within a rapidly changing environment. Since 1999, we have added charter jets, event management, and personal protection to our range of services. Mention this ad for $25 off your next round trip reservation. Alliance and you. Together, we can achieve the extraordinary. 855-546-6996 or AllianceLimo.com. While the temperatures are cooling down, the fall bite is heating up. Albies, Bonita, Blackfish, Alligator Blues, and Stripers are following the large schools of bait that are abundant in the Long Island Sound. If you love the New England coast during autumn, this is the time to be on the water. The latest from Shimano, Quantum, Avet, Hoagie, Phase 2 and more are in stock and ready to go at the dock shop. And don't mind those fall breezes with jackets, hats, gloves, and fleece from Grundens and Stormer. The dock shop will keep you warm and dry. Boater, beach bum, fisherman, or simply love the New England coast, this is a unique place to shop. The dock shop. 
now in two locations, 51 Tokenique Road, Darien, 609 Riverside Avenue, Westport, or on the web, docshop.com. And we're back with this Friday edition of your Coffee Break on the HN Network. I'm Kate Chaplinski, and it is time to throw it over to Donald Ang's look back on this day in history. It was the day state troops stood in opposition to federal law. But first, we go to 1789. The U.S. Congress passes 12 amendments to the Constitution. The Congressional Apportionment Amendment, which was never ratified, the Congressional Compensation Amendment, which was about a century later, and the 10 that we know as the Bill of Rights. 1956, TAT-1, the Transatlantic Telecommunication Table, opens. It could handle a whopping 35 transatlantic calls all at once. 1974, the first ulnar collateral ligament replacement surgery, also known as Tommy John surgery, is performed on baseball player Tommy John. What are the odds that Tommy John surgery... Anyway, uh, and finally, 1957, there was this. An extreme situation has been created in Little Rock. This challenge must be met. And with such measures as will preserve to the people as a whole their lawfully protected rights, if resistance to the federal court order ceases at once, the further presence of federal troops will be unnecessary and a blot upon the fair name and high honor of our nation in the world will be removed. Mob rule can not be allowed to override the decisions of our courts. Little Rock, Arkansas, 300 U.S. Army troops stand guard as nine black students were escorted to class at Central High School. The children had been forced to withdraw two days earlier because of unruly white mobs and the Arkansas National Guard, which had ringed the school with orders to admit only white students. 1957, not that long ago. But it's still history. That's your look back at today. And I'm Donald Ng. It was the day. And now it is time for a look at local sports. AJ Simonowski is going to be helping us out. And first, we're going to show you some highlights from last night's game. And off the free, it's pooched down. A lot of traffic out in front. Now stolen away, pinballing off a couple of players. Thrown down, yeah. and they score! <laughs> Let's see. The approach... And the kick, and he goes top shelf. Almost the same placement as against Greenwich, and it worked. A long punt down into the Ludlow end, turned over, taken by Brandt, Brandt, Brandt sends it. Oh, just wide. Oh, a great effort by Brandt. Took the ball away from, I believe that was Bellucci. Came in, a nice shot just a little <laughs> wide. Brandt's got to get back up, although five to yeah. go. Here's the long goal kick. Down to midfield, down to one, and this one comes to an end. And that would have been a dramatic game winner right there. Night on the H. Quite a game is seen here last night on the HAN Network. Eric uh, Gendron forgetting to turn my microphone on. Ludlow and Wilton played to a one-all draw at Taft Field last night. Mason Jennings had the goal for Ludlow, while Harrison Aller scored on a penalty kick for the Warriors. You can rewatch the game on HAN Network On Demand. Also in boys' soccer, Trumbull beat Danbury 4-2. to two. Heading over to girls' soccer, Darianne topped Stanford 3-0. To three to nil, excuse me. Trumbull over New Canaan 2-0, to nil, and Norwalk over Central 5-0. Quite a beating there for the Bears. Field hockey now. New Canaan found themselves in a 2-0 deficit to Staples before rallying for an eventual 3-3 tie. Ellery Baran and Cameron Dayton scored for the Rams, while Gabriela Vega had the tying goal for the Wreckers. Elsewhere in field hockey, Wilton beat, State, uh, beat Greenwich 2-1, Norwalk over St. Joe's 6-0, and Darien over West Hill 9-0. Ouch. Girls volleyball now. Ridgefield topped Massac 3-0 in a match dedicated to Carrie Dupuis, who died in a plane crash in upstate New York this past Sunday. Carrie's sister, Burke Dupuy, is a member of this year's Tigers. Allie Livingston finished with 24 service points, including seven aces and 20 assists for the Tigers. Elsewhere in volleyball, Trinity Catholic beat Law 3-2, Stanford over Bethel 3-0, Greenwich over West Hill 3-0, Abby Wolf there with 20 kills. St. Joe's beat Bennell 3-0. Common score in volleyball last night. For today's schedule, a lot of sports going on in the FCAC. Fair, uh, field hockey sees Fairfield Ward traveling to Danbury. 
In boys' soccer, West Hill plays New Canaan. Trinity Catholic plays Stanford. A very long bus ride there for the Crusaders. St. Joe's takes on Staples. Norwalk takes on Darien. And Fairfield Ward travels to Ridgefield to play the Tigers. Girls' soccer, Staples takes on Greenwich. And New Canaan plays West Hill. Girls swimming and diving, West Hill Stamford takes on Darien, St. Joe's against Shelton, Norwalk McMahon against Trumbull, Fairfield Ward at Fairfield Ludlow, also a very long bus trip there for the Mustangs. Girls volleyball sees Danbury take on Norwalk, Trumbull and St. Joe's mix it up. Stamford plays Staples, Brian McMahon heads to New Canaan, Fairfield Ludlow to Darien, Bridgeport Central at Wilton, Trinity Catholic heads to Ward. Football tonight, Friday Night Lights, Stanford plays Ward, West Hill takes on Trumbull, Trinity Catholic at Norwalk, Ridgefield at Ludlow, St. Joe's at McMahon, Staples at Wilton, kickoff for all games, 7 p.m. Tomorrow, FCAC football on the HAN Network. The Greenwich Cardinals host the Darien Blue Wave. We begin our coverage at 1 p.m. with your FCAC tailgate, hosted by Kate Chaplinski. FCAC game day follows it, too, with Rob Adams, a bevy of guests, local celebrities, dignitaries, and other people happen to be hanging around our cruiser at Cardinal Stadium. Kickoff will be at 4 on the HAN Network. With sports, I'm AJ. All right. Thanks, AJ. Well, getting back to some more news today, a faulty heating pan led to a four-point health violation in the New Canaan High School cafeteria kitchen, but according to the New Canaan Advertiser, it was fixed days later. The New Canaan Health Department arrived to inspect the cafeteria's kitchen on September 1st to find chicken cutlets at 115 degrees and chicken parmesan at 129 degrees. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention states that the internal temperature of cooked chicken should be at least 165 degrees. According to the health inspector who issued the violation, Carla DeLucia, the high school failed several health inspections in the past, but was always quick to remedy the situation. This was one of those cases, as the director of food services at New Canaan High School, Bruce Gluck, noted that the heating pan was fixed as soon as possible. Gluck said that a four-point violation is an automatic failure, one that occurs in extreme situations, such as the chicken coming in at 115 degrees. However, he said that the chicken was cooked previously and put into a warming pan to make sure it stayed above that 165 degrees. They were unaware the pan was not working. The repair to the pan was made only days after Delucia said uh, after she made her initial foray into the kitchen. When she returned on September 17th, she gave the kitchen a rating of 98 out of 100. Gluck gave an example to explain at the state that the chicken was in. It was totally cooked, and it's not that it wasn't edible. It's just that there's a higher chance for bacteria to grow with that temperature. Gluck said there was only one faulty pan out of six warming pans in the kitchen, and there were about nine pieces of chicken in that pan. The food warmer would have been normally set to 180 degrees. The NCHS cafeteria typically serves around 300 students from the hot food lunch line per day. Earlier this month, East, South, West, and Saks cafeteria kitchens passed their health inspection with scores of 98, 98, 100, and 100, respectively. Well, in other news this morning, in Stratford, a decision on whether a tree on Broad Street should come down will be made next week. Public Works Director Maurice McCarthy said Thursday afternoon that he will decide by next Tuesday on the fate of the huge tree, which stands just outside of the Christchurch Cemetery. McCarthy met with about a dozen residents at a public hearing on Thursday morning to explain the situation with the tree. Several residents along Broad Street are hoping that the tree can be saved. McCarthy said reports from three arborists that he has to still review. He said, I'm trying to come up with a reasonable solution, uh, but McCarthy has been told that the tree, which is more than 100 years old, is beyond saving. James White, an arborist from Milford, said earlier this week that the tree has substantial splits and cracks, mostly caused by a large branch hanging over the cemetery. Another large branch fell from the tree in August, breaking four gates that surround the historic cemetery. McCarthy said the tree's condition poses a danger to the public traveling on Broad Street. Well, the second one-year moratorium on medical marijuana facilities expires on November 3rd in Ridgefield, which leaves the question open of whether to allow medical marijuana facilities and how to regulate them. The Ridgefield Planning and Zoning Commission expects to take up that discussion in the next couple of weeks. Betty Brocious, the town planner, has prepared a sample set of regulations on marijuana growing facilities and dispensaries, which she said is based on Wilton's model. Included in the Wilton regulation is a 
requirement for a 1,000 foot separation from schools, churches, playgrounds, daycare, or another licensed facility. The commissioners will be invited to consider the regulations if they are leaning toward allowing medical marijuana into Ridgefield. The Planning and Zoning Commission adopted the moratorium to have an opportunity to look at where the interest was. Some towns and cities such as Danbury want no part of medical marijuana and have regulations, uh, sorry, they want part of medical marijuana and have no regulations uh, allowing the facilities. Towns are allowed to have regulations on these facilities which are permitted under state law even though marijuana is a federally controlled substance. Towns that have dispensaries where marijuana is sold to those with special permissions from the state include Bethel, Brantford, Bristol, Hartford, South Windsor, Windsor, and Uncasville. Applications for another 19 dispensaries have been received by the state in time for a recent deadline. Medical marijuana is prescribed by doctors with special certifications for the treatment of symptoms of a number of serious diseases and conditions. It is not covered by any insurance. Well, it's about time to throw it back to AJ for another look at today's weather. Nothing has changed, Jay. <laughs> it's still beautiful outside. Currently 67 degrees here in Shelton. Going to get down to about 52 here tonight. Over the weekend, much the same. High 60s during the day, low 50s at night. Chance of some slight showers uh, Sunday night into Monday, but doesn't look like we'll have too much to worry about. Some clouds around, but nothing too major. I forgot to mention in my earlier report tomorrow where we will be in Greenwich for the Greenwich Cardinals Darien Wave uh, football game. High of 69, low of 55. We're going to have a great day. Kate, back to you. All right, looking forward to that, AJ. Well, we're going to take another break, and we... When we come back, we have a lot more news, and we're also going to be taking a look at the top stories on our HAN websites this week. That's coming up after this. High Cut Rockefeller Estate is Westchester County's top cultural attraction and is now open for the season. Don't miss out. Go online to HudsonValley.org to plan your visit. Take a drive out to beautiful Sleepy Hollow, New York and enjoy High Cut's stunning architecture, breathtaking gardens, expansive art galleries, and commanding Hudson River views. From world-class art by Picasso and Warhol to expertly tended gardens, there's something for everyone. High Cut Rockefeller Estate, a national trust for historic preservation landmark. Back to school means back to busy, and Stewart's Market can save you precious time by stocking all of your favorite essentials under one roof. For a healthy start to school, we have all the ingredients. Walter Stewart's, your family-owned fresh local market, 229 Elm Street and at stewartsmarket.com. Tired of all the bull? Relax and enjoy the experience of buying a car at Panby Chrysler Jeep Dodge and Ram. No bull allowed. Have no fear. HAN Network's Fast Frights movie contest is here. Can your film make the cut? Submit your three-minute scary movie today for a chance to win a DJI Phantom 3 drone. Sponsored by Milford Photo. The only thing to fear is missing the deadline. <laughs> And we're back with more of this Friday edition of your Coffee Break on the HAN Network. I'm Kate Chaplinski, and we're getting back into some of today's news. Well, in Trumbull, raising awareness to domestic violence and abuse, the 8th Annual Clothesline Project is scheduled for Friday, October 9th through Friday, October 16th. Started on Cape Cod in 1990 to address the issue of violence and abuse, the Clothesline Display is a vehicle for anyone affected by violence and abuse to express their emotions by decorating a t-shirt. Ask for a free t-shirt now to decorate at the Quality Street Library Circulation Desk. The Clothesline will hang in the park beside 
inside the Trumbull Library. Anyone can add their decorated shirt to the line or leave it at the library service desk and someone will place it on the line for you. On Wednesday, October 14th, a vigil will be held at 6 o'clock in the evening in the Trumbull Library community room. Vigils are free and everyone is welcome to attend. Every 15 seconds, a bell will be rung as a reminder that domestic abuse occurs every 15 seconds. For more information on that, you can call 203-452-5197. And if you're in need of a domestic violence hotline locally, that number is 203-384-9559. Well, state police have arrested a 38-year-old Groton man who is suspected of robbing a bank in Old Lyme on Wednesday. State police identified Herman Butchie Smith of George Avenue in Groton as the man who robbed the Webster Bank at Seven Halls Road just before noon on Wednesday and fled on a bicycle after putting money in a satchel. Soon after the robbery, police released surveillance video of the man wearing a blue and white Yukon cap, a white t-shirt with dark colored sleeves, khaki shorts, and white sneakers, and said they were looking for him in connection with the robbery. The Connecticut Bankers Reward Association also offered a reward of up to $1,000 for any information leading to his arrest. Police obtained a warrant for Smith on Wednesday after he was identified as the suspect, and on Thursday, state police from Troop F and the Major Crime Squad, as well as the Mashantucket Pequot Tribal Police Department took him into custody at his home. Well, in Shelton, the Pine Rock Park Volunteer Fire Department is having a community tag sale at the end of the month. The sale will be Saturday, September 26th from 8 to 4 p.m., rain or shine, at 722 Long Hill Avenue. Vendor space is currently available $25 for a 10-foot by 10-foot space and $5 for a table rental. The department is also accepting donations for its table to sell items. You can find out more about that at 203 583 one five nine one. And it may seem a little bit early to be thinking about Christmas, but money is currently being raised to improve the holiday decorations and town green lighting in Wilton Center for the 2015 holiday season. According to First Selectman Bill Brennan, an informal ad hoc holiday working group has been formed, composed of Ann Nash from Signature Style, Nancy Sachs from Sweet Pierre's, Peg Colmer from Realty 7, and First Selectman Brennan. They said we're going to upgrade all the garlands in the center of town around the light pole and get new lights that will be energy efficient and can last for a long time. In addition, new red bows would be bought and hung on the poles. Comer said there is a 10-year guarantee on both the garlands and the bows. She also announced a big red chair will be placed in the center around Thanksgiving, affording families a holiday photo opportunity before the season starts. Sachs, with the help of the Chamber of Commerce, is encouraging downtown business owners to decorate their doors for the season. She's also reaching out to local businesses that are outside of Wilton's Center and offering them the opportunity to dress the doors of vacancies there. They will also be able to advertise their business while providing continuity for the town decoration efforts. All 6,000 lights on the town green holiday tree will be replaced with bright and efficient LED bulbs. According to Nash, Wilton Hardware is selling the lights to the town at a discount. Well, coming up this Sunday night, the skies will be greeted by a reddish supermoon and a lunar eclipse, a combination that hasn't happened for 30 years and won't happen again until 2033, according to NASA. The moon will appear bigger than normal during the eclipse because it will be closest to the Earth while in orbit, which scientists call a perigee. Because the orbit of the moon is not a perfect circle, the moon is sometimes closer to the Earth than at other times during the orbit, according to Noah Petro, deputy project scientist for the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. When the moon is the farthest away, it's known as an apogee, and when it's the closest, it's known as a perigee. On September 27th, they're going to have a perigee full moon, the closest full moon of the year. Well, now we're going to switch gears and take a look at some of the top stories on our HAN community news websites this week. Most of that top news has been tragic. In Ridgefield this week, uh, as we said, two students died in a plane crash, two Colgate University students who were both from Ridgefield. Heartbreaking story there. Catherine Dupuis, and, uh, who had gone to Ridgefield High School, 
and of course uh, Ryan Adams, who was a student at St. Luke's. That story was the biggest story among all our websites this week, followed closely by another tragic story in Ridgefield, which was Ryan Megan, who was 19 years old and also a Ridgefield High School graduate. He died in a car crash close to Yukon at the time with another student. Uh, and in some of our other top news this week, sorry. Uh, also, Gustav Whitehead, who we've talked a lot about on the HAN Network. There's going to be an author talk featuring uh, Gustav Whitehead's first in-flight efforts. So that is actually a big story this week. And it's been a big topic in the region as that's been debated, uh, whether the Wright brothers or Gustav Whitehead were, in fact, the first in-flight and, of course, we uh, had some big celebrity news. New Canaan native Allison Williams got married in a secret celeb-filled affair. The New Canaan Advertiser posted a little bit on that based on a report on page six of the New York Post. So that was another big story this week. I'm going to throw it back over to AJ. One last look at Friday's weather. And this weekend, AJ, what's coming up? Kate, much as I've said for the previous weather report and the one before, it's going to be a beautiful day today and the rest of the weekend. Highs just about near 70, currently 67 here in Shelton. Low is going to be about 52 nearly all the way through the weekend. Chances of some showers Sunday night into Monday. Mostly sunny, some clouds here and there, but really nothing to worry about. Tomorrow in afternoon in Greenwich, high of 70, low of 55 for our HIN Network football game. The Darien Blue Wave visit Cardinal Stadium, kickoff at 4 p.m. Rob Adams and Chris Irway, I believe, will have the play-by-play. FCAC Tailgate starts your day at 1 p.m. FCAC Game Day follows that at 2. Give us a chance to reset there before kickoff, but it should be a good game. Okay. All right. Thanks, AJ. Well, as you said, I'll be back tomorrow. Can't wait to join you guys for the FCAC Tailgate at 1 o'clock in Greenwich. But for now, that's going to do it for today's coffee break. I'll be back Monday at 11. Have a great weekend, everybody. This is the HAN Network, the leader for local news, sports, arts, and entertainment in southwestern Connecticut and beyond.